This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. Why is Charlotte's uptown better than Atlanta's downtown? I'm Jeff Sonier. Stick around. We'll show you how today's uptown successes all started here in Charlotte almost 50 years ago. Detour signs, orange construction barrels, and concrete barrier walls. It's all part of the Blue Line Extension Project. When it's completed in 2017, it will promote economic development in the University City area. I'm standing on one of 31 acres at the Lomax Incubator Farm. Coming up, I'll tell you how this operation is helping to grow the next generation of farmers. And we announced the winner of the Community Give Back Contest. Don't go anywhere. Carolina Impact starts right now. WTBI PBS Charlotte presents Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by. The Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. Charlotte versus Atlanta. In football, it's the Panthers against the Falcons. In basketball, the Hornets versus the Hawks. But there's more than scores at stake when the two cities compete in business for new companies, new jobs, and new young professionals searching for a place to call home. WTVI's Jeff Sonier is uptown with more on the latest chapter in this big city rivalry. Well, Amy, this time it's Charlotte's uptown versus Atlanta's downtown. And even Atlanta's hometown newspaper says this time Charlotte's actually winning in the battle over which is the better place to live and to work. Charlotte is a little like your kid sister driving past you in the car that you loaned her. He's Michael Cannell, a business reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, who wrote the story that started all this Charlotte versus Atlanta stuff, or maybe just restarted it. And so Charlotte's got this dense downtown where they call it Uptown. It's a downtown that has the offices and sports arenas and sports stadiums. It's got a lot of restaurants and it's got neighborhoods that surround it that are, if not walking distance, pretty close to walking distance. They appeal to people and to, to companies really the same way, in many of the same ways, that Atlanta appealed to people and companies a generation ago. The other thing that stands out about Charlotte is that Charlotte is a town that has had a plan. This is the Odell plan that was produced in 1966. Cheryl Myers unfolds an almost 50-year-old map in her office at Charlotte Center City Partners. Myers is the senior VP for planning, describing the early days when Charlotte leaders first laid out much of what we see uptown today. How good have these plans been over the years in terms of charting the growth of Uptown Charlotte? Uh, they've been implemented. Uh, we just don't let our plans sit on a shelf. Um, the Odell plan located our government center, for example. It recommended building high-rise residential as far back as 1966, which is kind of unprecedented. Independence Square in Charlotte. In fact, in Charlotte back in 1966, a master plan for Uptown's future was pretty big news. It was called Downtown Charlotte back then. The sidewalks crowded not just with office workers, but also shoppers. The traffic on Trade and Tryon, just as busy then as it is now. A new office space, new retail space. And weaving through that downtown traffic in his flashy convertible is master plan architect A.G. Odell, whose maps and models, even back in 1966, were remarkably similar to how we see uptown now. Where Independence Square would be right over here. Odell points toward Trade and Tryon, where his vision for the square included a hotel, offices, and a park with a monument. 
which is pretty much what Trade and Tryon looks like today. Same story a few blocks away here in Uptown's Fourth Ward neighborhood. This is Fourth Ward now, and here's Odell's Fourth Ward plan back in 1966. We proposed for that a high-density residential area. Uh, we want to see established here a new park, possibly a new school, garden-type residential homes, high-rise apartments near the First Presbyterian Church. Today, those high-rises Odell predicted for Fourth Ward are right across the street. And then there's Bank of America Stadium in Third Ward, alongside Belt Freeway with the skyline in the background. Odell's vision, again, almost identical. Take an ideal place near the freeway for easy access to a new stadium for Charlotte. If Charlotte does not move, it will lose its position of predominance in this region. You know, the museums, the theater, the bars and restaurants, all of it working together has really made this a very unique place in our community. We've got an unlimited demand uh, or, or interest for wanting to live uptown. Uptown planners say developers are interested too. In building uptown and bringing jobs uptown, which brings people uptown kind of all coming together to um, build a great city. I mean, we're all in the city building business. While Atlanta, Charlotte's big brother for so long, now sees itself as kind of stuck in its own overgrown suburbs. So Charlotte in its region is the dog, not the tail. In Atlanta, it's almost the opposite. By the way, that uh, Odell plan we've been talking about, well, the city's actually been updating it every 10 years or so, changing it as the city changes, hoping to continue the success they've had here in Uptown over the past 50 years in the next 50 years. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff. What an interesting comparison between Charlotte and Atlanta. Well, joining me now is Michael Smith, President and CEO of the Charlotte Center City Partners. Michael, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, glad to be here. What are some of your thoughts after seeing that very interesting comparison between Charlotte and Atlanta? Well, Atlanta is a city that we have great respect for, kind of our sister to the south. And they're a great competitor, but in so many ways, we do not want to be Atlanta. We want to be Charlotte. And that's, uh, that's a great challenge for us and, and, and a fun team sport for us. Well, you know what, there are so many transplants, like <laughs> myself, who have come from the north because not only are there great businesses, but it's a great uh, climate to live and raise your family. You know, what are you seeing as so many of us flock from the north to the south to here? How is that changing the way our city grows? Well, I think that's one of the unique advantages that this city has is number one, uh, culturally, we welcome newcomers and put them on the team really quickly in a way that uh, is different from other cities I've lived in. So if you're talented and you're interested, you're immediately put into the team. But then secondarily, although we're a 250-year-old city, we're a new and young city in so many ways so that newcomers are able to come and be a part of creating the city. We're, we're all city builders. You know, when we saw that story, seeing that historical footage from the 1960s of the city planning and then actually seeing so much of what they predicted came to fruition. Isn't Guglio Odell just such a character? Oh, I loved his car. Yes. It was pretty exciting to see that. How do you take, planning is so important for, for being uh, the city that we want to be. I think we discussed being intentional about it yes. and not just letting it happen. How do you be intentional in your planning now moving forward? Well, that's another legacy that we've all inherited is the intentionality of our city. And it's, it's more than a plan that sits on the shelf. Uh, we invite the community into very collaborative processes and we create a vision of what we want to become. And the beauty is we revisit it every 10 years and it's not just the public sector building infrastructure. We've got a great history of our private sector uh, filling jobs, making investments that complement and help us to collectively fulfill that vision. Well, while we always have good intentions, things don't always turn out exactly the way you plan them to. Sure. And one of those perhaps uh, size that had pros and cons when we created the 277 loop. Yes. 
cities all across the country were doing it, but there was some interruption to our neighborhoods. How do we deal with that and adjust for that moving forward? So the 2020 vision plan talks about that a lot and has that aspiration of trying to knit those neighborhoods back together. You see such a big drop in property value inside the loop versus just outside the loop. And the more that we're able to, to bridge that and knit those neighborhoods back together, I think the, the more quality uh, neighborhood choices that we're gonna have for the citizens to live in walkable urban environments that have quality grids right outside of, of Uptown. And how do you do that? What are some key components to that? Well, there's, there's connectivity with, with bike lanes, uh, there's lighting under the bridges, there's, uh, there's more radical ways like bridging over parts of 277 or tunneling parts of it. Um, those are things that we're gonna have to go a ways in the, the value of our land in Uptown so that we get to a point where creating that land is then more feasible than, it's almost like you run out of supply. But there are, there are some strategic spots where that is viable and could be part of our future, and other cities have done it. And lots of growth coming our way. Michael Smith, President and CEO of the Charlotte Center City Partners, we appreciate your time and all the work you're doing to help grow our city the right way. Thanks, it's our honor to serve. Well, Center City Charlotte isn't the only place undergoing major changes. When is the last time you traveled on North Tryon Street between Center City and University City? The changes taking place now may surprise you. Construction of the Lynx Blue Line extension is in full swing. As WTVI's Jeff Rivenbark explains, hundreds of people are working on this massive project and it's expected to generate lots of economic development in many communities along the North Tryon Corridor. Buzzing hair clippers <laughs> and laughter are two things you'll hear inside Taper's Barbershop. Lately, what's going on outside is generating quite a buzz. The traffic, uh, pretty much that's it. The inconvenience with the traffic, that's about the biggest thing. Brian Lord says he's noticed about a 25% drop in business since construction started along North Tryon Street. You know, we're just, uh, hey, staying above water right now and, um, weather in the storm and you know we're looking forward to the end result when you're driving out here knowing where to pull off to get to the barber shop is a bit of a challenge for the most part you know our customers they have to put up with the traffic I think we're losing a lot of potential new customers you know it's just the inconvenience of the uh, road construction okay so I have a kitty orange I have a regular ice cream with whipped and a regular French vanilla a few miles away, getting in and out of the parking lot at Pelican Snowballs isn't so bad. We found lots of customers stopping for their favorite ice-flavored treat. Okay, that would make nine, and one is 10, and the guys will send it out right over there. Thank you, sir. Tina Sassaman says it's too early to tell what impact construction of the Blue Line Extension Project will have on her business. We get a little apprehensive as far as what that's gonna mean to us, as far as it, you know, actually being right where we are, as far as people pulling in and out of our parking lot. We just don't know. We feel it'll be really good or really bad. One of the most dramatic parts of the light rail project taking shape now is across from UNC Charlotte, where dozens of workers tie rebar and pour concrete for the footings that will support a multi-level parking deck at the corner of North Tryon Street and J.W. Clay Boulevard. Yeah, there's a ton of activity going on right now. We have um, really accelerated the construction in this area. Danny Rogers is the project director for the Blue Line Extension. If you go up and down Tryon Street, you've seen they've really upped how much activity is going on. They're working everywhere right now. When the $1.16 billion project is completed, this station and 10 more will be located along 9.3 miles of track. Passengers will be able to travel from University City to Center City in about 22 minutes. And even better than that, you'll be able to connect to the existing line and keep going. So you could even do some of the restaurants in South End or even go farther. With only 20% of the project completed, headaches for residents, businesses, motorists, and pedestrians are just beginning. What we're doing is trying to get the Tryon Street, the road part, pushed out and done so that we can open it back up and still build the light rail down the middle. So we're trying to minimize the amount of time that they're gonna to have to go through this difficulty. So we understand their pain. We're trying to get it done as quickly as possible so that it's not as long. If you drive up and down North Tryon Street, you're gonna notice hundreds of orange construction barrels like this. When the Blue Line extension is completed in 2017, it's expected to move 21,000 passengers a day. 
There are a lot of orange barrels up in University City, but with those orange barrels comes some really tremendous investment in this area, and I think everybody has their eye on the end product. Darlene Heater is executive director of University City Partners. She says there's lots of excitement about this project. We have a big residential base. We have a big employment base here. Um, we have a very suburban road network um, that we are trying to improve upon. And this light rail is going to provide tremendous opportunity for workers and residents and visitors to get to and from University City in a different way other than in a single occupied vehicle. And ease and congestion is pretty important considering some 80,000 people work here. Just as the Lynx Blue Line along South Boulevard has been a catalyst for economic development, the Blue Line extension is projected to have a similar impact on communities along the Northeast Corridor. It is a transformational investment um, for University City, and the day we cut that ribbon is going to be a very happy day in this community. For now, construction hasn't really ramped up here, so stopping the Pelican snowballs is easy for customers. The hurdle will be getting through all the construction. We just don't know exactly how much that's going to cut off the accessibility to people actually getting here. I think it's it's just going to benefit everyone, you know, and it's just going to bring a whole totally different look to North Tryon. I'm looking forward to it. While the next couple of years could be a make it or break it situation for smaller businesses, the ones that survive could wind up benefiting in a very big way once passenger trains are up and running through here. From Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenbark reporting. Thanks, Jeff. If you live or own a business along the North Tryon Street corridor and want to know how the next phase of the Blue Line Extension project is going or how it could impact you, go to ridetransit.org to sign up for updates. You can also find more details posted with this story on our website at pbscharlotte.org. Well, we're going to shift gears now. Let's talk about what you had for dinner. Did you have broccoli or green beans? Chances are something on your plate came from a farmer. Statistics show farms across the nation are getting smaller, and it's becoming less common for family farms to stay in the family. So who will grow our food in the future? WTVI's Danielle Koser explains how a new type of farm works to grow the next generation of farmers. Over 100 acres of land greet you at Hodges Farm. Rustic barns peek out from the pasture. Well, life on the farm, I kind of laid back. Ain't much an old country bull of me can't hack. With a history dating back 200 years, this is the oldest running farm in Charlotte. These tall green fields used to look much different, transforming from a cotton farm to a dairy farm. Then we kind of switched into agritourism. We got horses, went into the pumpkin patch and Christmas trees, and the rest is history. One constant through the years, the farm's focus on family. This is, you know, this is where I belong. At 28 years old, Connor Newman is a 12th generation family farmer. It's always kind of been my dream to come out here and work on the family farm. Well, a simple kind of life never did me no harm, raising me a family and working on the farm. Today, he greases hinges on the tractor, preparing for a busy summer. That right there is a zirkin. Newman started working here last fall, taking over day-to-day -day operations just last month after his uncle, Frank Hodges, passed away suddenly at 62 years old. At his heart, he was a farmer. I mean, he's always loved this land. That's something I'm really going to miss, working with Frankie. Now Newman pays homage to his uncle by working the land, carrying on this 200-year-old family tradition. It was always, you know, my grandfather's vision for this to stay a family farm. <music> These days, it's less common for younger generations to grow up and become farmers by default, a trend causing the average age of a farmer to climb steadily, just as it has over the last 30 years. According to the Census of Agriculture, the average age of a farmer in the U.S. is 58 years old. So what we see is the people with the uh, knowledge and experience that you need to farm uh, are aging out of the profession. Aaron Newton manages the Elma C. Lomax Incubator Farm in Cabarrus County. These 31 acres serve as a training ground for a younger generation of farmers, giving them affordable access to land and equipment and teaching them the skills they need to be successful. So we're trying to lower that median age. As the average age of a farmer near 60, younger farmers are in danger of losing knowledge and experience typically passed from generation to generation. 
What we're doing here is replacing what was traditionally an intergenerational on-farm education system that started when children were very young. Just like farmers in training sow these seeds and then watch as they grow into healthy plants, the incubator farm helps grow farmers and then watches as they can eventually run operations of their own. Growing up spending summers at his grandparents' farm, Joe Rowland knew early on he wanted to be a farmer. I went to a career day, I think in sixth grade, um, dressed up like a farm, just jeans and a white t-shirt. When he met his wife, Danny, the two discovered they shared the same vision. Being around food has always been my passion. But with no land or experience, all this young couple had was a dream. After spending two years training at the incubator farm, the Rollins turned their dream into a reality. It just gave us the opportunity to get on the ground right away, start growing right out of the gate. Moving from an 800 square foot apartment in Uptown to this 18 acre property in Cabarrus County and expanding the farm to include dozens of crops and some livestock. Here, Joe's passion for farming moves from his heart to his hands. Grow food is really, if I had to sum up like what I want to do and what I want to be and who I am. That's what I do and it's what my hands do every day. Starting at the incubator farm allowed the Rollins to save money before branching out on their own, investing about $300,000 in property and equipment to get started. That doesn't take into account the, uh, the personal investments and the investments in time and labor and energy. But as the saying goes, big risks reap big rewards. Less than three years after they moved here, the couple says they're making a profit and expanding their customer base by delivering produce to local restaurants and selling at farmers markets. Just having that interaction with customers and know that our food is on their table, feeding their family. When you stop and think what you've done at the end of the day, the week, the season, or in five years, it's amazing, yeah, it's a good feeling. Raising chicks and staking tomato plants, the Rollins take pride in connecting with the community and growing the food for our future as they continue to learn the ins and outs of the land. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Koser reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. I feel like a country girl again. Well, a statewide 10% campaign encourages consumers to spend 10% of their grocery money on locally grown food. Statistics show North Carolinians spend about $35 billion on food each year, which means if everyone spent 10% locally, it would boost our economy by $3.5 billion. Well, now it's time for the results of this year's Community Give Back Contest that you voted online to pick the winner. You may remember our finalists were the Allegro Foundation, the Catawba Riverkeeper Foundation, and the Kings Mountain Historical Museum. Drum roll, please. Okay, I don't have a drum roll. But the winner is, after several thousand votes, the Kings Mountain Historical Museum. Congratulations. The organization will receive $10,000 in free promotion right here on your public television station, WTBI PBS Charlotte, throughout the next year. Well, you know following your passion is something I always encourage everyone to do. Tonight, we feature the work of a Charlotte artist who is a classically trained painter. After 10 years of working as a picture framer, Mark Gucciardi decided to follow his passion to pursue a career as a painter. He moved to Italy to study art and later moved back to the Queen City where he now paints portraits. We're not there to express ourselves and be creative really. We're there to learn um, the basics on how to see, not how to be creative, but how to see the physical world and how to translate that onto paper. When you have a straight line, you've got a good vertical um, reference point to compare how crooked a, a, a person can stand. Um, it's important to, I think, the beauty lies in the gesture. If you miss that, I think you're missing what's beautiful about a pose. The, when a model is relaxed, they start to sink in and they, their posture becomes even more exaggerated. And I think there's a lot of beauty in that. This is Osiris Rain Studios now the North Carolina Academy of Art. What we do here, we teach uh, classical French academic drawing and painting techniques. The ear is somewhere in that area. I know that. Down to the heel. Well, the toe is actually somewhere in here. The heel is there. I know that these two points here. Are... Mark is our primary drawing instructor. Um, both of us teach uh, painting and drawing uh, side by side with the students. Mark, I met him I'd say a few months when he got back from, after he got back from Italy. 
And honestly, I was so excited to have somebody who had gone through academy training and that maintained the same values that I did and interest in realism. And also to have someone who was as talented as he was and that was as passionate about art and painting. I was originally a picture framer at Coffee and Thompson. I thought, you know, if these people can pose as artists and, and, and sell artwork and I have to frame it and I know I can paint and draw, it bothered me and I thought, um, I'm wasting my talent. We started the business back in uh, 46 and that gave me an opportunity to open the art gallery in connection with a framing operation. Mark is, uh, he, he's very instrumental in uh, doing the artwork itself and being able to follow through and become a very outstanding artist. Uh, and he does a lot of repair work for us too, along with antique painting and so forth. So he's very qualified to be in our art gallery. This painting is called Checkmate and it's a still life. Usually still lifes, you look at them and they're just still, they sit there. But this one, you have to involve your mind. You crawl into the painting and you try to figure out what is the checkmate. I try to leave nothing by chance, nothing arbitrary. Still life, for me, is like an empty stage and I start to set it as though it's uh, theater. In classical training, Basically, what, you're, what we're learning is how to see again. In my mind, I'm drawing 24 hours a day. If I walk down the street, I may squint and tilt my head at something and look at it like this and go, okay, yeah, that's a good painting, and walk on. You can't shut it off. Once you learn to see in this way, I do see things very differently when I look out the window, when I look anywhere. Yeah, you can't help but to see differently after a training like that. Mark's paintings and drawings can be found in private collections in Europe, Asia, and North America. You can see some of his work on display at Coffee and Thompson Fine Art Gallery and Framing located on Moorhead Street in Charlotte. Our team wants to know about the exciting artists around your neighborhood. So please send us your story ideas for future artist profiles to carolineimpact at wtvi.org. Well, now, some news about two very important events. This year marks the 50th anniversary of your public television station, WTVI PBS Charlotte, and we've been committed to education all these years. And that's why we've invited New York Times bestselling author and Inc. Magazine's number one leadership expert in the world, John Maxwell, to come and teach on his new book, due out this fall, called Intentional Living. We'd love for you to join us at this fundraising event on Thursday, May 21st, from 9 to 10.30 in the morning. There's even a chance John could answer your burning leadership question. He'll do 30 minutes of Q&A at the end of his teaching. And our cameras will be recording the Professional Development Seminar for distribution nationally to PBS stations this fall. Ticket information is on our website at pbscharlotte.com. Org. Well, another big event we're hosting is our Community Health Forum, featuring a panel of experts talking about obesity, high blood pressure, and hypertension, health issues that affect so many people in our area. Our Community Health Forum will be held Wednesday, May 27th, from 2 o'clock to 3.30 in the afternoon at Pease Auditorium on CPCC's central campus. Novant Health Wellness Coaches will be there before and after the event offering diabetes, hypertension, and obesity screenings. You can find all the details on our homepage at pbscharlotte.org. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by the Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. Production of WTVI PBS Charlotte.